Welcome to Compassionate Conversations, where we push the boundaries of comfort to empower you to become all that you dream of being. Hi, I'm Esther Kane. I'm a Canadian psychotherapist and the author of It's Not About the Food, a woman's guide to making peace with food and our bodies. For over 25 years, I've been helping people to overcome problematic relationships to food and their body image. And to my great delight, my book has helped thousands of people to do just that. I decided to do this series where I interview other body image warriors who I respect and love their work in order to help us form more of a community around talking about our disordered relationship with food and our bodies in the hopes that we will find strength in each other's stories and share some really helpful tools and methods that you can use in order to heal your relationship with food and how you see your body. If you're thinking, I don't know if I have an eating disorder, so maybe these videos won't be meaningful to me, please give it a chance. When I tell people, for example, that I'm an eating disorder therapist, people automatically think eating disorders are just anorexia and bulimia. And while I treat those issues in my practice, the bulk of my clients tend to fall into the category of emotional eating. People who eat when they're mad, sad, glad, and fearful. There's all kinds of reasons that we turn to food. And they are usually um, the people that are yo-yo dieters, that do obsessive exercising. Maybe they are in middle age and their body's metabolism has changed and they've put on some extra weight and they just can't seem to get it off. All of these people fall into uh, the category of um, some type of disordered eating pattern. So if that applies to you, please stay tuned. I'm going to be interviewing some fabulous people in this series who will definitely give you some great ideas and tips in order to make peace with food and your body. I recently interviewed Dr. Vera Terman, author of Food Junkies, as well as Clarissa Kennedy and Molly Payne co-hosts of the Food Junkies podcast and founders of Sweet Sobriety, who all talked at length about the link between food addiction and highly processed foods. Today's guest, Dr. Joan Ifland, is considered to be the world's leading expert in processed food addiction. She holds a PhD in addictive nutrition and is the author of the textbook, Processed Food Addiction. She is the founder of the Online Addiction Reset Community, as well as a Facebook group, Food Addiction Education. Welcome, Joan. I'm so happy. Thank to have you. you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm so happy you're here. So, yeah, it's it, your name just kept coming up over and over again in these discussions. Okay. And I've heard you on several podcasts and I thought, oh, she'd be perfect. So yeah. let's talk about the standard American diet. Um, which is what most people eat today is filled with highly processed, low nutrient, cheap foods. And you call them addictive food like substances, which I mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that and give those listening more details on the food industry and exactly what happened in the 1980s? Because I, I heard you talk about this. It's fascinating. Yes, yes. So way in my distant past is a Stanford MBA, which I earned in 1978. That's wow, a long so you got an MBA as well as a piece. Yes. Incredible. And so the, having the MBA and being interested in business models and trained to look at business models, uh, that broke the code. I mean, that broke the secret mm -hmm. open. Mm -hmm. I knew that processed food corporations were behaving in addictive ways. And when I finally like started to focus on, you know, it's the tobacco industry that came in 
in the mid 1980s and in three short years bought Kraft, Nabisco and General Foods, oh, possibly wow. the three biggest players in the US processed food industry. Mm -hmm. Now, corporations that make their money from addictions, they're doing very specific things. They have a worthless product, they have a destructive product, and yet they can make money off of it because it's addictive. Mm -hmm. So they're making their money off of the addictive properties of the product. There is no other, there's no value to the product. So cigarettes are a perfect example. Mm -hmm. There's no value to cigarettes, none, yeah. zero, zip. So part of the addiction business model is the advertising mm -hmm. and the, the attaching of certain values because the product has no value. Yeah. So you have to go elsewhere and attach values to the product. Mm -hmm. So in the case of cigarettes, they got Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall, for example, to attach sexiness, right, right. allure, you know, romance right. yeah. to cigarettes. You see one movie scene after another where they're flirting and they're smoking. Right, right. So that's, that's part of the addiction business model. And then uh, they got suffragettes to smoke. Yes because they said, well, if you're going to be like a man, then you need to smoke like a man. Wow. And they got the returning, the veterans from uh, World War II, they got, the, they got people to send cigarettes to soldiers because they attached relaxing oh. to cigarettes. And then um, as the soldiers returned from World War II, they attached masculinity mm -hmm. to cigarettes and then they morphed that into the like the marlboro country store the cowboys mm -hmm. were cowboys. Yep. yeah yeah so they created this whole mythology around this very very destructive very disgusting mm -hmm. i mean that is the business model that came over to processed foods right. in the mid-1980s yeah. Now, processed foods have no value. Yeah. They are quite destructive. We don't need them to survive, that's for sure. No, quite the opposite. So when tobacco came into processed foods, they brought their addiction business model. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of snacking. There wasn't really a snack industry yes. before tobacco came in. Yeah. But just like they created a smoking addiction, nicotine addiction, they created it. Mm -hmm. through their addiction business model mm -hmm. they then came in and created uh, a snack industry not based right. on uh calorie needing calories yeah. because the food executives they said no 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 you can't have a snack industry everybody's full from their meals right and those tobacco executives it's just like oh, we'll make you a snack industry right because what happened in 1980 fulfilled another there are five A's to the addiction business yes. model. Please, I was going to ask you about the five A's. Very yes. good. Let's go so there. Another one is affordability. Okay, so we'll start with it. First A is affordability. First A was advertising. Advertising, okay. Okay, the second A is affordability. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened such that we, we got to two-thirds of American adults smoking? Mm -hmm. Well, here's what happened. Before the cigarette rolling machine came was invented, there were cigarette uh, factories where people were rolling cigarettes mm. by hand. Oh. And then you could buy a pack of, of cigarettes that had been hand rolled. Mm -hmm. Once the cigarette rolling machine was invented, a man named Duke figured out that uh, he could drop the price of the cigarettes. And so he bought. He cornered the market on the cigarette rolling machines mm -hmm. and was able to drop the price to like five cents a pack. This is, oh. I think we're talking 1930s here. Amazing. And he went on to make a fortune. That is yes. Duke University today. That's that wow. university was founded on cigarette money. Oh, terrible. Addiction. Yeah. 
So that that was this, the thing that happened in 1980 mm -hmm. that I think got the attention of the tobacco industry. I mean, they were circling mm -hmm. the processed food industry. It's, as early as 1963, mm -hmm. a tobacco company bought a Hawaiian punch. Hawaiian punch. Oh, which to jump. create a sugar addiction in children. Yeah, well, that worked. So you can see the tobacco industry was circling, but they they need you need all five of the A's to have a successful addiction business, and yeah. they didn't have the affordability because they would have been depending on their fellow drug dealers, the mm -hmm. sugar cartel in Florida, for their primary addictive ingredient. Yes. But in 1980, high fructose corn syrup came on the market. Yes, high fructose corn syrup, which is in everything pretty much now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that was unlimited. And it was very, very cheap. Yes. And we had, uh, you know, hundreds of square miles of corn that could be converted to high fructose corn syrup. Great. Very destructive. Um, it converts to fat. Yes. Two and a half times more readily than sugar. Wow. Uh, they knew how to advertise. They knew how to create deception. Mm -hmm. And now they had number two, they had an affordable product. Mm -hmm. And because they were forced out of the U.S., they had distribution networks for cigarettes throughout the whole world. Mm -hmm. So they had, uh, th then the next A is um, accessibility, mm -hmm. you know, av availability. Availability. So if you're going to have, if you're going to support an addiction, you have to be able to put your hand on the product easily. Yes. To yeah. reinforce so that when you get a craving, you you can act on the craving mm -hmm. instead of going through withdrawal. Right. Right. So once you've gone through withdrawal, the craving disappears. So you need to be able to put your hand on the product very quickly. You need to be able to afford it and be able to put your hand on it in order to maintain the addiction. And avoid going through withdrawal. And I just want to say, Joan, too, that with food, unlike other addictions, it's easier to get. It's everywhere, the, the processed food. Whereas, you know, if you want to get alcohol, at least in Canada, you have to go to a special store right. and you have to show ID and be a certain age. Whereas food, um, this highly processed food, it's available to toddlers, you know, anybody. Yeah, it's and that's deliberate. It's part of yeah. the business model. Yeah, so they already had from tobacco, they already had like contracts with the corner stores around the world. Mm -hmm. And they already had advertising contracts. Mm -hmm. Well, in advertising, the greater volume you advertise with, it's you get volume discounts. No. So when they laid the processed food advertising budgets on spending on top of what they were already spending on cigarettes. Mm. It was very, very cheap advertising, and they could do a lot of it. Wow. Yeah. That's so that's queuing. Yes. You, um, the addiction, these, these sensitized reward centers now, the addicted reward centers, most loss of control over addiction starts with a cue, a trigger, a reminder, oh. a signal, some kind of stimulation from outside yeah. the brain. And so that sound or vision or smell then sets off the reward centers wow this is so you so when you when you put advertising into the mix it's just deadly yeah okay so now you have affordability you have high fructose corn syrup you have availability as they're taking out the cigarette vending machines they're putting in snack and soda vending machines right okay can we just talk a second joan about what happened to the cigarette industry? You know, how did that get, you know, I mean, smoking is not as popular, obviously, now. Yeah. So we did have a win there. What had to happen for that, the demise of cigarettes? Oh, gosh. You know, that took 50 years. Many, many more people died because uh, cigarettes are highly addictive. Uh, but the, the tobacco companies eventually got uh, beat in the courts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is great. The tobacco industry is getting beat. They're handing over billions of dollars in fines. They're putting on deposit 
uh, hundreds of thousands of internal documents at University of California, San Francisco. It's part of their court settlements. Well, what we now see from those documents, there are great researchers at University of California, San Francisco, going through those documents and piecing together the story. Mm -hmm. So what happened was those, this is very hard to listen to, and I'm sorry that's so hard to listen to, mm -hmm. but- It's important though, very important. Those executives were taking the Marlboro Country Store addiction model mm -hmm. and transforming it into like the Kool-Aid wacky warehouse. Mm. to addict children to, to sugar. Mm. So how do those reward programs work? Well, you start out advertising the product, especially with coupons mm. and especially with rewards because you have to get the consumer to use the product often enough. If you have Kool-Aid once a year, you're not going to get sugar addiction. Yes. But if you are incentivized, oh, if I buy X number of these, then I get a, a you know, Kool-Aid um, wristwatch. Yeah, I remember things like that when, when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. There were prizes and stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. You had to buy enough of it to send in the coupon, to send in the purchase mm -hmm. uh, slips, and then you would get a, a reward. Yeah. So that's, those reward systems, that's, Use the product often enough to establish the addiction. Mm -hmm. Send in for a reward of some kind, which is actually a cue. Yeah. So now the kid is being those reward, those hypersensitized reward system. Every time that kid looks at that Kool-Aid watch, well, they explode into cravings for Kool-Aid. It's operant conditioning, isn't it? Yes, it's operant conditioning. This is Pavlovian conditioning. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is brain manipulation in small children. It's brain alteration. It's addictive brain alteration in small children. I just, I, I just, it's just way, way up there on the list of evil things that you can yeah, do in the world. It really is. And there they are in their internal documents, just bragging about it, crowing about how successful it is. They even did things like they sent um, smell aroma, like cards that the child would scratch while they were watching a particular TV show. So they would get the visual and the smell wow. and the taste. And so it was compounding the addiction. It's just, wow, it's diabolical. It's devilish. Right, right. Okay, so that's... Um, Advertising availability, affordability, young age of onset. Uh, okay. Young yeah. age of onset, sure. because the younger you addict a person, any animal, mm -hmm. this has been replicated in uh, lab research, the more difficult it will be for that person to kick the habit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And then the fifth A is the uh, product formulation. So mm -hmm. when tobacco came into to processed foods, they hired a consultant, Howard Moskowitz, mm -hmm. who has a PhD in experimental psychology of marketing from Harvard. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And he developed a technique for hiding, uh, for hiding the maximum amount of sugar, fat, salt in a processed food before the consumer could detect it. Oh my gosh. Wow. So he went around to, you know, innocent, innocent looking products like yeah. cigarettes look innocent. Yeah. So innocent pasta sauce, innocent tomato right. sauce. Yeah. And if you look at pa pasta sauce in particular, it's always got sugar in it. And I remember my grandmother saying, why has it got sugar? It never used. Yeah. 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 Because you can hide it in there. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Why do all the vegetables have salt in them? Yeah, My children's lunchables have such extreme amounts of fat and salt in them. Yes, it's because children are born with a predilection, a preference for sweet, but you yeah. have to teach them salt addiction. Really, huh? It's just diabolical. Oh my gosh! 
That's yeah, amazing. and then load on the dairy. Dairy is a substance where if a 100 pound animal, a calf, yeah. drinks dairy right out of the cow, oh, yeah, it'll put them to sleep. Wow. It's supposed to. Huh. That calf needs to lie down and absorb no nutrients. Right. So right. dairy has four natural casomorphines in it. Really? I don't eat dairy because I've never been able to, but interesting yeah so that's why the fast food places uh, they have all seven of the major categories of addictive substances being sold as food right. so if you look at pizza or a uh, burger or um you know taco places they all have flour mm -hmm. they all use gluten which has a yeah. natural morphine in it yeah. gluteomorphine yeah. Excessive salt, dairy, yeah, yeah. Uh, processed fats, excessive fat. It yeah. doesn't have to be processed as long as it's excessive. Yeah. And it has caffeine. You know, they're sold with caffeinated drinks. And then yeah. who knows what food additives. Yes. So this is this is why uh, fast food is so lethal. Yeah, yeah. French fries, for example. So many people addicted to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That is amazing. Okay, so we kind of answered the following questions. How did and does this teach the brain to crave? I think you've answered that. And what is the impact on the brain and body when processed foods are consumed? Maybe could you elaborate on that a little bit more in terms of what happens from childhood once a child is set up for addiction and, you know, mm -hmm. teenhood, adulthood? How does that go? Yeah, so... Why Why is there such a broad range of disease? Mm. Um, how can processed foods cause such diverse diseases as depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and ADD and learning disabilities and memory loss mm -hmm. and poor decision-making and poor impulse control and respiratory issues and gut issues? and heart disease, and diabetes, mm -hmm. and reproduction problems, and skin problems. How is that possible that one set of substances could do all those things? Well, here's how it works. Again, this is really hard to listen to, but uh, it's happening to millions of people. So I'm just grateful that you're putting it, getting it out there. Well, I'm grateful that you're sharing it. I'm sure everybody listening is grateful because you're gutsy. This takes courage. I was even thinking, has anyone threatened your life or safety? I mean, really, this is. I'm, I'm waiting. When I, I'll know, that's when I'll know I'm doing a really good job. No, the you're bold and up at my front door. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So here's how it works. Okay. Processed foods make us very tired. Mm. Um, they are inflammatory. Yes. So that's one of your first big answers to why why would something as diverse as um, depression and skin problems, why would they both get yeah. worse and why would they both get better? Well, because processed foods are inflaming every cell in the body. Mm -hmm. And inflammation is sort of at the root of all disease, isn't it? Or most common disease. Yeah, it makes the cells unable to work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why do you have disease? It's because cells aren't working. Right. But once you realize that, and once you realize, oh, it's the cells, it's mm -hmm. the cells. And what is it about the cells? Well, it's not just inflammation. You also, these cells are being surrounded by fat and sugar. Mm -hmm. And so they're rapidly processing it, uh, trying to get it out of the bloodstream, because if your blood glucose is too high, uh, you'll die. So you've got insulin there just working away to get this sugar inside blood cells so that the brain doesn't die. And it creates trash. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're byproducts from that and they build up inside the cells. And then the mitochondria cannot move around the cells. There's too much gunk in the, in the cell for the mitochondria to move around. And so the cell just gradually stops functioning. Right. Okay. So that's happening. Then you have the receptors for insulin on the outside of the cell. Uh, they just wear out. They slide down in, inside the cell and they stop working. 
-hmm. So now the cell can't get glucose in. And um, so it's another reason why the cell stops working. Well, that's probably why we see so much, the increase of type 2 diabetes. It's so insane right now. It's an epidemic, epidemic. Uh, yeah. and heart disease. Yeah. Like those poor cells inside the heart that are supposed to be pumping blood. Uh, you know, they're, they're not pumping blood. Right. And sugar creates plaque inside the arteries. It's not fat, it's sugar. Okay. Okay, so on and on and on. Mm -hmm. I finally got a hold of this myself um, about a year ago. But we've had an online community really focused on, this is a deeply seated addiction. People mm -hmm. are sick from it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. Unlike tobacco, you know, clean air is everywhere. You can just start breathing clean air. Unlike mm -hmm. tobacco, when you get off of processed foods, you have to find replacement food. Yeah. When you're yeah. sick and you're at 44% of Americans are now obese. Yeah. And, and then there's withdrawal as well. It's really you have withdrawal. Yeah. You have joint pain. Uh -huh. It's hard to move around. You're tired. You're depressed. You're angry. Mm -hmm. And when you get in your car and you're making a decision about whether to go to the grocery to get ingredients to make a clean, safe meal versus driving through a fast food, it's not it's not a fair fight. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're going to drive and get the, the fast food. What, okay. Why do you think that is psychologically, you know, just because I work with it's you? Not it's not psychological. It's not. It's So you're saying it's physiological because of the addiction. Yeah. And because... Uh -huh. Once you, so 44% of the country is obese now. Mm -hmm. And the research on that is that it's creating deep physical impairment. Mm. So people are hurting, their joints yeah. hurt. Yeah. They can't walk very far anymore. Right. They can't reach over their heads. Mm -hmm. They can't grasp things. They can't carry things. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, oh, well, why don't you just go to the store and buy the things and make a meal? They might not have the physical capacity anymore to do that. Really? Wow. Yeah. So wow. it's an incredible study where yeah. they measured physical impairment in obese people. And it was, it was shocking to me. I keep thinking, yeah. okay, I know the worst of it. And then I see a study like that and I think, oh no, oh my gosh, this is so much worse. Yeah. So that's one thing I really want to emphasize over and again, which is that nobody asked for this. This was done yeah. by the tobacco companies. It's not your fault. Is it's not your fault. And yeah. you're not to blame for it. And yeah. the whole diet industry has made it much, much worse. Mm -hmm. So if you are telling yourself, oh, I'm a failure, mm -hmm. that's that's a kind of psychological abuse called gaslighting. Yeah. Your yeah. doctor tells you you're a failure or the diet industry yeah. tells you you're a failure or your dietitian yes. tells you you're a failure. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. They yeah. are offering you broken programs. They are offering you broken approaches. Yeah. Things that could never possibly have worked. They, and yes. then because yeah. they want to keep making money, they tell you it's your fault. Your fault. Or they tell you that the condition is incurable. Right. Or they tell you the condition is a chronic disease and you'll have to take medication for it for the rest of your life. But yeah. None of that's true. I know. Oh none my God. Oh, I have so many questions for you, but I want to get into the, um, okay. So in your opinion, how many people that eat the standard American diet, as you've described, have a food addiction and how can people identify if they have a food okay. addiction? This is great. It's a great question. I adhere very closely to the diagnostic criteria for addiction that uh, is published by the American Psychiatric Association. Mm -hmm. It's in a big manual called the DSM. Five now, I think, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, DSM five. I know I've got it around here somewhere. I could wave it around. <laughs> <laughs> so there are 11 criteria. Uh -huh. And when you look at research uh, showing how many people are exhibiting those criteria, I come up with over 80% of Americans are suffering from this addiction severely. Mm. So uh, there are 11 criteria. Eight out of 10. 
Yes, yes. So eight out of 10 people in yes. the United States. That's alarming. The, um, so there are 11 criteria. And if you meet six or more of them, you have, you're considered to have a severe addiction. Mm -hmm. So I would say 100% of Americans have the addiction. Mm. 20% at a lower level. Mm. But 80% uh, and the, the six criteria that most people have, 93% uh, of Americans have high blood glucose, mm. blood pressure, triglycerides, cholesterol, or waist to hip ratio. Mm -hmm. So that's 93% of Americans meet the criteria used in spite of knowledge of consequences. Jeez. Yeah, so there, there's right there. If you meet even one criteria, you can be considered to be pre-addicted. But then um, over 80% of Americans are overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. So that's um, um, number one, which is unintended use. Mm -hmm. Nobody intended to get overweight or obese. Right, nobody signs two. up for it. Right, right. Yeah. Number three, and uh, the next one is uh, failure to cut back. Mm -hmm. Same group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's cravings, mm -hmm. which are shown to correlate it with people with higher BMIs. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, uh, withdrawal. Yes. So people are suffering from withdrawal symptoms, which are headaches and depression. If people listening to this, I mean, this is this is absolutely heartbreaking, the information you've relayed here, but very essential. But now I want to move into how we can heal our relationship mm -hmm. with food and empower ourselves in the face of this. So if people listening to this recognize that they have a food addiction, what steps should they take starting now? Like what are some concrete yeah, um, you can go to foodaddictionreset.com. Mm -hmm. Take the self quiz. There's a quiz. Okay. Okay. Take the self quiz. You'll get onto our email list and you'll be invited to a free workshop. And we will go over what happened to you. Mm -hmm. What did the tobacco industry do to you? Mm -hmm. And what did the diet industry do to you? to make it all so much worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so the diet industry wakes up a part of the brain, Yeah, uh, uh, the fear of famine brain. Let's talk about the diet industry because I specialize in eating disorders for over 25 years now. And oh my gosh, the amount of, most of my clients are diet casualties, I would call them. Mm -hmm. and, you mm -hmm. know, victims of that system. Mm -hmm. And so can you uh expand further joan on the diet industry and yes yeah i think that'd be very helpful so instead of saying oh 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 high fructose corn syrup converts to fat two and a half times faster more readily than sugar so let's get all the process the uh, high fructose corn syrup out of your system no 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 they didn't do that hmm Instead, they said, let's reduce calories. Right, right. Well, if you don't eat enough, there's a, the, the most powerful part of the brain. Well, under circumstances of famine, mm -hmm. the, the power source in the brain shifts. Mm -hmm. It shifts from, I need to fit in. I need to be normal because if I'm normal and I'm in a group and I'm accepted in the group and I'm doing what they're doing, then they'll find me food, water, shelter, raise my children and protect me from predators. Mm -hmm. So under normal circumstances, that's the most powerful part of the brain. Yeah, yeah. And once you know that, then you know the pathway to recovery is to surround your pe yourself with people who don't eat this stuff, who don't yeah. entertain stress, blah, blah, blah. Right. But under circumstances of famine, it shifts. Mm. You go back in here to the reptilian brain. Yes, yes, that's what I was thinking. And that's a very different behavior paradigm. Fight or flight so, or freeze. Well, it's actually if you uh, if you're in a famine, 
you want to separate yourself from the tribe mm. because now your best survival strategy is if you find food, eat it all really fast. And don't share, I guess. Don't share. Yeah. Right, right, right. And then because you're stationary, uh, you don't want your fellow tribe members to find you. Mm. And you don't want predators to find you because they're starving too. Mm. So once you've eaten it really fast, then you run away and hide. Wow. That is binge eating. That I was just thinking that is bulimia, that's binge eating, that's every eating disorder, you know, even with anorexia, people go through that phase of over, oh my gosh, that's, that is, that blows my brains out, Joan. That's, yeah. yeah fascinating yeah i do also want to share with you some research from the last couple of years and we've got two really stunning studies well the first one was a review article which means that the researcher looked at a lot of studies i think there were 81 studies so this reviewer looked at 81 brain scan studies of people with eating disorder diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Every one showed active addiction. Really? Mm. So eating disorders to me are like, so mm. if somebody's snorting cocaine, you don't have a snorting disorder. <laughs> if you don't, if you're shooting up uh, heroin, you don't have an injection disorder, ejecting yeah. disorder. Yeah. So eating disorders are an attempt, I think, by the processed food industry to take the focus off of the substances. I say, oh no, it's not a substance use disorder. No, no, it's not the, about the substances. Right. It's not about the processed foods. Right. It's a behavior disorder. It goes over okay. here with gambling or sex or, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's a behavior disorder. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a really serious, deeply seated uh, substance use disorder. Yeah, it's interesting because Dr. Vera Terman, author of Food Junkies, and I, we, we discussed that exact topic and, you know, the difference between uh, food addiction and eating disorders. And we're talking about, yeah, the psychological versus the physiological, but I don't, I think it's very complicated. And um, yeah, I, I, I do see a lot of addiction in eating disorder uh, clients a lot. Yeah. Um, so you say people need to work on obsession and cravings. And the way to do that is to change the firing patterns in the brain. How does one do that? Okay. They change your brain's firing. Yeah. First of all, you uh, you know, so the big, big strategy, which everyone misses, is to recognize the role of cueing, mm. triggering, messaging, stimulation, reminders. And that is what starts off the cravings. Th that so the cravings are active. Your brain is actually flooding with dopamine, serotonin, cannabinoids, and opioids. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why this is such a severe addiction. It's because of the combination of all those, the, the sugar, the gluten, the flour, yeah, yeah. The, the, the excessive salt, the dairy, the excessive fat, the food additives, and caffeine. So mm -hmm. when you combine all of those, you're activating all four Mm -hmm. of the major addictive pathways and i'm just wondering like with alcohol addiction or some other drug it does it trigger all of those oh. neuro neurotransmitters or is it different no no it doesn't that's the thing mm -hmm. like marijuana activates the cannabinoid system cannabis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the cannabinoid mm -hmm. system is named after cannabis yeah yeah but it's also activated by excessive fat Hmm. So um, the, you know, opiates activate the opioid system, mm -hmm. but the opioid system is also activated by excessive salt, dairy, and um, gluteomorphine. Hmm. Okay. So if you were doing marijuana and opioids, that's going to be a harder addiction 
to put into remission mm -hmm. than if you were just doing one or the other. Right, right. It's, it's called polysubstance abuse. Right. And it's harder to put into remission. It's harder to get the person off of, you know, it just makes common sense. It's harder to get yeah. off of many substances than it would yeah. be to get off of one. Yeah. But it's because you've got all of those substances activating all those pathways. If you were only using alcohol, for example, mm -hmm. and you got off of alcohol, well, then the other systems can still make you feel okay. They're still yeah. working. Yes. But when you when you don't have any of them working, they get down regulated, which means that the, the the way you feel something or think something is one neuron releases a chemical that then hits the next neuron and the neuron receives that chemical. And then you experience the, the feeling or the thought or the behavior. Yeah. So what happens when you're eating all these processed foods, Americans eat 73% of their calories in processed foods. Jeez. All of these receptors are hit way, 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 way too often and they collapse. Hmm. So you can't have a good feeling. You can't have a pleasurable feeling. And your world goes dark. You see yeah. this gradual increase in suicide rates. Yeah. Those are people whose feel good, their dopamine and their serotonin and their opioid mm -hmm. and their cannabinoid receptors are so downregulated. Yeah. Their world has gone dark. They well, can't and, receive and they, good. I heard that in the last, it was two to five years, uh, the rates of depression have doubled. Yeah. Depression yeah. Exactly. Mental illness is skyrocketing. Yeah. But it's the same reason why heart disease is skyrocketing. Whether it's a heart cell that can't pump blood anymore or a brain cell that can't create dopamine anymore, it's the same breakdown. It's on mm -hmm. a cellular level. Mm -hmm. So the good news is, is that when you get off, you have to do two things. Yeah. What are those? You have to get off the processed foods. Mm hmm. Just like you get off of alcohol and you have to get off of stress. Okay. So you have to get off processed foods and you have to lower your stress. So let's talk uh, brass tacks. What are some concrete actions to do those two things? I only have one answer. And I'm sorry, it's going to make me cry. This is so bad. The hardest thing to do is accept what happened to us. But right. step one is to accept what happened to us. Right. These tobacco companies came in and they just caused cell dysfunction in millions of people. And we've lost right. loved ones. Right. I know everybody you talk to now, I'm so sorry, but. No, don't be sorry. We've lost a loved one. They don't have their grandparents. Right. They don't have their partners. Right. Yeah. They don't have their children. Yeah. They don't have their neighbors. They don't have their college yeah. roommates, you know? Yeah, yeah. A million, 1.6 million. And, and those are just the people who died. Right. The people who are on just disability rates are going up in young people. Yes. In 20 something year olds. Yeah. They're, they're on disability from obesity and depression and yes. uh, joint pain and, and so on. So wow. um, the hardest thing to, to do is the first step. Yeah. And that is accept that you need immersion recovery. Immersion. You need to surround yourself. So okay. typically in, I'm sorry, but typically no. in, in severe addiction recovery, you go away. Right. You go away to a residential facility yeah. for a year. Uh -huh. And then you go to a halfway house for another year mm -hmm. or maybe a couple of years. Why? It's protection from cueing and triggering. Right, right, right. It's protection from availability. Mm -hmm. It's protection from people around you drinking or mm -hmm. using. You're the the main thing. Okay, so two things. One, you're protected from cueing. You're protected mm -hmm. from those industries being able to stimulate your brain into loss of control. Mm -hmm. Because when you're flooded with cravings, Mm -hmm. from being exposed to a trigger, you know, your frontal lobe's not working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those neurotransmitters can go right over to the behavior center and control your behavior directly. 
Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is your behavior is under control of the, re the reward, hyperactivated reward system. Mm -hmm. And this logical front frontal lobe is not getting blood fl flow and it cannot help you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is not your fault. And anybody right. who says, I ain't having some willpower, they yeah. are gaslighting you. They are psychologically abusing mm -hmm. you. You mm -hmm. have an addiction. Right, right, okay. right. So the first thing you have to do to me, and this is why we created the online community, is get yourself among like-minded people who mm -hmm. are already doing what you want to do. Right, right. Because that part of the brain, the drive to feel normal, you've got to satisfy that part of the brain. Yes. You've got yeah. to protect that part of the brain. Mm. If your brain sees other people eating processed foods and taking medications, mm -hmm. your brain will make you do that. Mm. But if you're on a Zoom screen, like we broadcast 15 to 17 hours a day live. Wow. So you have a you have blocks of broadcasting and then you have a break and then blocks of broadcasting. Mm -hmm. We have a video library with I think we're probably close to 80 videos that I've made over the years. Mm -hmm. So when there's nothing live going on, you can get out a video. We mm -hmm. record a conference call every day, an hour long mm -hmm. conference call. So if there's nothing live there, you can listen to a recording mm -hmm. of the daily conference call. What are we doing? Why do we do that? Yeah. Blocking out cues, blocking out triggers. Well, I'm probably giving yeah. new information to the brain that is a, a, of a healing kind. Right? Yes. Yeah, so there's lots of science. You know, we're to we're totally science based. Yes. Yeah. You so kindly mentioned. You know, we're based on science. This is the yeah. Textbook. Wait, show your book. You have to put it in the middle. It's not in the screen. Yeah. Process food okay. addiction foundations assessment and recovery. Okay. So yeah. that's the book. Three years, 2,000 studies. I wrote 70% of it, and other experts wrote the other 30%. That's we are based on science. If I see a study this works, then we can incorporate it into our community. Right. So it's a lot of conversation. It's a lot of science. It's a lot mm -hmm. of relaxation. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of um, things that we know that work. Right. Uh, coherent breathing and mm -hmm. meditation and exercise and cognitive restoration, putting that frontal lobe back mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. But it's all day long. It's 24 hours a day, which yeah. means that you never have to choose between being alone, which is very stressful, or watching TV. Because mm. TV is oh, you're bombarded by food, processed food. Stress. Yes. Stress. Mm. It causes stress watching TV. So stress activates the addiction. Right. So how does TV cause stress watching TV? Oh my gosh. Just if you, if you look at it for 12 seconds, something stressful is going on on that screen. Mm -hmm. Somebody's being mean to somebody. Somebody's shooting up drugs. Somebody's eating processed food. Somebody's killing somebody. Yes. Somebody's betraying somebody. Yeah. It's just, if you look at the programming over the years, yeah. it was already really bad in the 1950s. Right. But just think about the Three Stooges. Yeah. Violent. Each other. Yeah. Think about um, Roadrunner. Right. Runners constantly Terrible. Getting run over. Yeah. It's, it, the violence was there very, very early on. Yeah. And it's designed deliberately to create stress. Because when people are in a stressed spot, they are more likely to buy something. Uh, interesting. Now, but here's the here's the terrible thing about that. The body's not designed to be in a stress spot all the time, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is happening to people now. So when you're stressed, you're in fight or flight and your blood flow is going over to your muscles. Hmm. So now those poor cells, which were already malnourished and can't clean themselves fast enough and surrounded by sugar and fat now they have no blood supply because mm -hmm. so they're going the into fight or flight to mobilize to because yeah, there's the blood perceived danger your muscles right right so all those glands and organs aren't getting blood supply right. chronically through the day it's okay if you know the 
the neighboring tribe is attacking you, then you that for those moments, you need your blood supply to go to the muscles. But it's right. this is all day long. Wow. And people are dying from it. Yeah. So the the next thing you have to do is that surround environment, that environment that you're immersed in, it has to be a hundred percent kind kind passionate okay. gentle yeah so all of our people and we train our own people and anybody can train to be one of our managers uh they are trained in the language of compassion nice. respect explanations what happened to you and then skills mm -hmm. we teach 149 skills mm. because for you to protect yourself from this unbelievable this is a lethal culture that we live in it kills people mm -hmm. the unregulated advertising the unregulated product formulation and the people all around us eating this and dying from it um you need protection from the culture but we need to be able to live continue to live go to yeah. work yeah uh, and so this is how you protect yourself is that you know you can get zoom on your your smartphone mm -hmm. on your tablet on your computer so anytime anywhere the design of the program is such that you can open up your device and hear kind voices mm -hmm. your tribe and mm -hmm. that will stop the cravings you'll get a big oxytocin mm -hmm. release and oxytocin travels to the craving centers and regulates them mm -hmm. so and then you're getting skills so that when somebody says, oh, you know, I'm just dropping off this candy for your kids, you know what to say. Right. And when somebody is like, oh, come to my house, we're having, a, you know, whatever awful thing, you are trained in how to either take your own food or decline, you know, how to read yourself mm -hmm. and know what is the best answer for you. It's very, very complicated. You can the brain won't let you live differently from other people around you. But if you're but you can get your brain to believe that your ARC members are your your people. And right. so your brain will let you live differently from everybody in your physical environment mm -hmm. because it's you've satisfied it, you've protected it, you've you've gotten it engaged with. A community of clean eating people and so it'll settle down and let you do that right it'll even lead you to want to do that right right yeah. right right, right. Yeah. oh this has just been absolutely fascinating Joan. i'm i'm going to be my head is going to be spinning for a while after there's a lot to process let me just add one other thing yeah esther you are doing a job which we cannot do so what I would say is this, you sign up with Esther, get Esther's expertise and expert, because we're all peer support. We don't have one license in our community. We work in conjunction with somebody like Esther. Mm -hmm. So Esther gets done with her session with you, but you don't, but then you're not out in this sick culture. You can open your screen and relax into your, your safe culture. Yeah. And the other thing, I just want to make one other point, which is this whole idea of incurable diseases, sorry, incurable diseases and chronic conditions, and you have to take medication for the rest of your life, or you have to get surgery, or mm -hmm. uh, or you're going to die. All of that is also not true. Mm -hmm. We have seen over the five years that we've had the ARC, a lot of incurable diseases go into remission. A lot of chronic conditions go into remission. Well, and what can because, you name some of them, Joan? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, depression, anxiety are the big yes. ones. Yes. But somebody raised their hand the other day and said their bipolar had gone away. Wow. Which it makes absolute sense because bipolar is cells that are acting too fast mm -hmm. and then not fast enough. So if you're regulating them and they're getting blood flow and they're getting nutrition and anti-inflammation and, and immune function, well, then they're going to stop doing that, which mm -hmm. is going to act the way they're supposed to act. Right. Um, somebody reported a seizure condition really? coming under control. Um, wow. Diabetes, certainly um, irritable bowel, Crohn's, 
heart disease markers, skin problems, mm -hmm. reproduction, mm -hmm. uh, asthma, all the inflammatory diseases, uh, just anything that you've been told is incurable or chronic, mm -hmm. uh, please go to, we actually have a new community that we're forming for this specifically. Go to remissionoptimistic.com. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. put all of this up in the show notes, Joan, so people can thank check you. it out in your communities. And I oh, I just want to thank you. This has been so enlightening today. And I'm so glad I had you on because we just touched very briefly in the other interviews I did about food addiction on the processed food. And you've just expanded upon it and given us the whole framework, the history um, physiologically, psychologically, what happens to people, the spiritual consequences. Um, and yeah, so I'll have all of your information in the show notes for people to get a hold of you and your community. Great. Uh, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Uh, but just remember, it's not your fault. <laughs>